Good. So today, I would like to start with um, with a little bit of a repeat of the end of last session because we were basically thrown out, uh, or I mean, I ran over. That's rather the truth. And um, then um, by uh, also using this um, to look a little bit more into the intuition. Um, leading us then into um, the um, realm of excursion sets and smoothness. So um, I think we have the most abstract parts of um, the story behind us, at least for now. So um, now things get a little bit more hands-on and related to the things that you actually see also when you uh, analyze fmri data and um, look at the various GUIs that um, software softwares for the analysis of fmri data provide so um, first thing i want to discuss um, are um, again gaussian random fields what's going on here um, that looks horrible There's something wrong. Um, and um, then um, I want to show you how to simulate them. Um, it's better here. And uh, then we are going to do excursion sets. Um, and then smoothness. Good. So, um, first of all, um, Gaussian random fields. Um, we looked at the definition last time. Let me find it. Um, I think I rewrote it a little bit um, in the new version. Um, so, a GIF, a Gaussian random field, um, on a domain. S subset R D is a random field. That's good. Um, denoted G X X in S, so G for Gaussian, um, such that every Finite dimensional um, vector of random variables, which one could also just call a random vector. And that's the thing I change. I use now a small g. Uh, for the definition of this vector because um, remember when we did the GLM stuff the y was always uh, lowercase and that was um, was a vector and um, distributed according to a multivariate Gaussian um, and uh, the components of this vector are still the random variables um, of the Gaussian random field evaluated at a discrete and finite set of um, values in the domain um, x1 to xn and to highlight that put this that this is kind of in uh, rn if it's realized is distributed According to a multivariate caution. Good. So the important thing really in this definition is um, that um, there one look that one looks at the finite dimensional um, distributions and um, 
then one has also from the theory of random fields one has an explicit um, um, yeah, construction rule of how to um, obtain the parameters of a multivariate Gaussian um, that one now wants to um, use to simulate uh, this. So one wants to draw realizations small g from a multivariate Gaussian with expectation parameter mu and uh, covariance matrix sigma. And of course these mu, um, the mu is of the same dimension as the vector that one is um, simulating and um, the uh, covariance matrix is of course n times n and needs to be positive definite. Um, and then um, the important thing is that um, if one defines the expectation function of um, the Gaussian uh, random field, for example, um, setting um, n to be zero, which is all, um, the case that we are most interested in for random field theory based p-value correction because we're interested in null distributions. Um, then one has um, um, the makeup, so this is the ith entry of mu, then one has the makeup of the um, expectation vector and for the entries um, ij um, one needs to define a covariance function that one can evaluate either in terms of um, the arguments ij um, from 1 to n um, in the case that the random uh, the Gaussian random field is not necessarily um, stationary um, but one can also um, evaluate this um, um, as a function of distance only. So we will concentrate, we will always, um, for everything that we do in terms of simulations and looking at pictures and so on, um, we will always leave the expectation function at zero. Um, one does not have to do that. Of course, one can use uh, random fields also with more interesting expectation functions to model observed data. Um, this is, um, again, just the... Um, um, yeah, this is due to the fact that this is used for p-value um, evaluation um, where one is interested in null hypothesis. It's kind of a little bit boring. This is why the whole the classical statistics is a little bit boring because one sets up fairly uninteresting um, probabilistic models. Um, but nevertheless, we will do that, so we will not worry about uh, this thing uh, much. So we are uh, mainly concerned uh, in the remainder, of, essentially, of the whole course um, with um, covariance functions and then uh, ensuring covariance matrices, um, but maybe even more the covariance function. And um, then I told you that there exists uh, a number of um, covariance functions, so um, there are not infinitely many covariance functions, or maybe there are if you parameterize things, but generally there are like 20 or so different covariance functions that are called PD because they generate a, um, positive definite covariance matrices. We are interested here um, primarily in one, um, which I call gamma. Um, because it's called the Gaussian covariance function. Again, not because we use it in Gaussian random fields. There's also something called an exponential covariance function, which you can use in Gaussian random fields. And this Gaussian covariance function, gamma, um, one can write in two ways. So either like this. Um, so it takes in um, two coordinates in the domain of the random field and maps that onto a single value evaluated based on this um, coordinates, which is defined as something fairly familiar, um, namely as the exponential of 1 over uh, square, the Euclidean distance um, between these two coordinates. Does everybody know what the Euclidean distance is? Who does not know what a Euclidean distance is? Everybody knows what's a Euclidean distance. Good. So it's really in 3D. Um, it's kind of the shortest um, um, way you can get from one um, um, coordinate to the other along a straight line. Um, and the length of this line is the Euclidean distance. Um, yeah. Um, 
And there are two parameters, this L parameter, which is kind of the spread of the covariance, in this case uh, over a space, and um, this uh, V parameter, which uh, scales the uh, overall thing. Um, and um, what you then uh, see here, and what, what I also briefly remarked on is, um, you have the um, Euclidean distance of um, x and y. So effectively, um, the function is just um, um, a function of the distance between x and y. Because uh, whenever you put some x and another uh, y in there, um, it all, um, what you get out only depends on how far x and y are um, apart in space. So um, one can then rewrite this uh, Gaussian covariance function if one wants to emphasize this um, as um, a function from um, yeah, the space of distances. Um, um, now where I'm still not completely convinced by this. Um, so now the function just has a single uh, input and this input I call um, delta for distance. Um, and this is then um, defined as the same thing essentially only that um, the oh and I miss a one half no I don't miss a one half because I don't have a one half in there um, just a function of the distance to the square because this is also the, the um, um, distance um, to the square from node no am I mistaken maybe I'm mistaken no the um, delta um, is defined as the Euclidean distance, and this is then why it's the same, because delta is defined as x minus y. Yeah. Um, so it's it's equivalent. So in the books, they also don't worry too much about the whole thing. Um, so we either write this uh, covariance function as a function of two parameters, um, but whenever you, you do that, you effectively only um, um, yeah, have one or two parameters, input arguments, I should say. So you can either write it as a function of x and y, or you write it as a function of the distance between x and y. That's, uh, in principle, fairly straightforward. But if one starts thinking about it, at one point, is, one is confused. But we don't have to think that hard about it. Um, good. So now I want to show you what that means in terms of um, um, getting realizations from um, Gaussian random fields. And for this, um, I have also now uploaded some MATLAB code that I use to create all of these figures. And I assume you're all proficient in MATLAB by now so that you understand uh, what I'm explaining. Um, yes, and we want to go here to MATLAB. So how can one now uh, make these um, pictures? Um, for example, the pictures um, of, the ren of the Gaussian random fields that we looked at uh, last time, um, where I show how the Thing varies as a function of oh, I don't have it here, as a function of um, the parameter in the Gaussian covariance function. So um, of course, um, this whole thing about uh, random fields being um, with infinitely many uh, random variables, if you implement that on a computer, it doesn't exist because everything is discrete in a computer. So uh, first thing that I do um, to do uh, to simulate that is to um, set up a discrete domain comprising. Um, n by n points um, um, along the is because I'm doing two dimensional stuff here along um, um, the x1 direction and the x2 direction. You might also call this the x and the y direction, but you know I'm calling that x1 and x2 in, the, in this course. And um, basically just create all the coordinates um, in this um, little uh, for loop here. Um, I set uh, the expectation parameter to uh, zeros. The important thing is here actually the number of um, discrete realizations because if you take in one dimension, so in, along the x1 you take, um, I take a k actually, there should be a k then I guess. Um, 
I take k. Um, so for example, um, 32 or something, then over the whole two-dimensional space, you then have um, 32 times 32. And um, that, as I said last time, gets a big quite quickly. So that's why this also uh, needs sometimes a little bit of time to evaluate. Um, and so essentially about the um, mean f uh, function or the expectation function, we don't have to um, worry. Um, the important thing is then to evaluate um, the covariance function. And um, the way I do that is that I have a little uh, function that um, evaluates covariance functions. So let's have a look. So that's one of the sub functions. Um, so that's um, the uh, covariance function. And um, that takes in um, as a parameter the specific covariance function denominations, for example, a Gaussian covariance function or it's a white noise covariance function or exponential covariance function. And um, then um, this uh, creates the covariance matrix. So I really want a covariance matrix that I can put into a, um, a random number generator. Um, it's done in a for loop for the upper triangular um, uh, matrix and then the full covariance matrix just evaluated by um, adding it to its um, transpose and um, accounting for the uh, doubled diagonal. Um, and then, of course, the question is what's happening here. And then for the Gaussian covariance function, um, this is um, what um, happens. I actually take it as a function of two parameters because I wanted to have it um, general also for functions that cannot really be written as uh, the function of the distance. Um, so here, this is actually evaluates the Gaussian covariance function. And then I do just what I just wrote in uh, there. So I evaluate this uh, delta as... Um, um, do I actually do that correctly? No, I do the square root of the um, pro uh, uh, dot product. So that should be the Euclidean distance. And then I square it and divide it by uh, L, put it into the exponential and multiply it by V. And then basically by these two functions, I get the covariance matrix. And then I really have a covariance matrix and uh, expectation vector, which can just be put. So where do we see an example? This is something else, which, which, um, oh yeah, which I put into um, uh, multi, uh, multivariate Gaussian number um, simulator here, so the MATLAB one, so the expectation function gets in and the covariance function gets in. Note that this is now, a, if you have 32 in one dimension, this is a 32 times 32 dimensional vector, so it's fairly long, and this is a 32 times 32 times 32 times 32 um, um, a covariance matrix. Um, and what you get out of that is, of, of course, a 30, um, two times 30, uh, 32 square um, vector, which is then reshaped um, according to the spatial layout, because um, the covariance function, of course, takes into account how far um, these two coordinates are, um, um, are apart. Um, and, and where they are in the field. So it's reshaped that this um, spatial ordering of um, the values that uh, get um, um, sampled um, is respected. And then it's just uh, plotted. Um, so it's in terms of the simulation of this, it's um, fairly straight uh, forward once one uh, yeah, is somewhat comfortable that these things get really, really big if one wants to have a fine resolution. So to show you again how this then looks, um, let's have a look at the script. Um, So this is what we've seen um, already last time. So this is the Gaussian covariance function evaluated in two arguments and in one argument as a function of distance. We have a D instead of a delta. Um, and these are then the realizations that were drawn, as I just showed you, from a multivariate Gaussian um, and then reshaped into um, this two-dimensional space. And what I vary here is this L parameter. So you can see as it gets, the L parameter gets longer, there's a little bit of a smoother appearance. Now the appearance of the whole thing, 
Um, so uh, in general, these Gaussian random fields with the Gaussian covariance functions, they have a Gaussian covariance function. They have this kind of blobby appearance. This is this is uh, due to the um, Gaussian covariance function. This is not due to the fact that this is a Gaussian random field, as the this figure shows, because these are also these are all Gaussian random fields. Um, this is a Gaussian random field where um, the um, random variables have no uh, dependencies. So the uh, covariance function is always zero if, if the arguments are not the same. If the arguments are the same, then it's the variance. And you see that this, I mean, it looks like, uh, I don't know, salt and pepper or whatever you would call this. Um, this, um, yeah just from the visual appearance, uh, looks quite different uh, to um, this kind of thing, which looks almost like the Gaussian. This is um, the exponential uh, function, where the only difference is actually the square, um, which exists for the Gaussian and doesn't exist for the uh, exponential occurrence function. And this also has a fairly different um, uh, appearance because it doesn't look that blobbly. It looks, I don't know how it looks, it looks more like things uh, yeah, follow fairly quickly once they fall off. And uh, I don't know how to describe how that looks. How does it look? Like a... Hmm? Sorry? Landscape, right? Landscape? On a map. On a map. This is a country also. Yeah, this... Yeah. I mean, so this here and this here, they look different. But it's not that easy to say whether they're different. I mean, here you have these blobs. Um, this what it, this shows is actually uh, what is that called? Um, look that up. No, I don't have it here, so let maybe I look just here. Uh, the third panel depicts a realization for a square rational uh, covariance function. So the square seems to be uh, important. So here we again have the square and then we have um, to the power of. So here you can, of course, um, take different values for alpha. And here again, you get this more blobbly appearance. Um, and finally, this thing um, shows what's called a Brownian sheet. And this is in contrast um, to these covariance function, no, maybe not this, but to this and this covariance function, um, this uh, field is then not differentiable in uh, space. So this is why this is more like a Brownian process in um, so Brownian motion in 2D. Uh, That's qualitatively, uh, at least from the math, quite different from um, the other ones. But uh, the point of this whole figure is um, this visual appearance of Ga the Gaussian random fields can look vastly different depending on um, the um, covariance function. Yeah? So we will deal mainly with the Gaussian covariance function where we get this kind of blobbly thingy. Um, but um, this is just due to the covariance function. Good. So this is what I definitely wanted to show you other questions about the simulation or the pictures something a and c uh, a shows the gaussian covariance function and c shows a gaussian random field So this is just the function. So A is just the function that is uh, written up here. So that's just uh, 313 visualized with Y set to uh, 0, 0, so the origin, and X uh, varied. And um, so this is just a function. And C shows realization from a Gaussian random field with a Gaussian covariance function. So it's really different, but it's good that you ask. Um, this is why here I chose the color map winter, and here I chose the color map jet. Uh, <laughs> other questions? Sorry, it's kind of my job to be a nerd. That's <laughs> uh, good. Uh, any other questions? There, there are reason why you use Gaussian covariance functions instead of other ones. 
Uh, yes, uh, because um, I want, so the reason why I use the Gaussian covariance function in the following is um, because I wanted to analytically evaluate smoothness. And um, I thought Gaussian covariance functions and Gaussians in general are always nice for mathematical treatment, so I was hopeful that I could get furthest with this. And if you work with uh, imaging data, do we also get in touch about the Gaussian covariance? That's the million dollar question. Um, uh, do we get in touch? If, well, this a, the, the question is a little bit imprecise. So the question is, uh, what do you mean? So do you mean in terms of the data that we observe that we can model that with a Gaussian covariance function, or do you mean that we, when we do neural imaging, sometimes come across a Gaussian covariance function? I think I mean, is is this an assumption in the software packages? That no, use? no, uh, no. Um, we will come to uh, what exactly actually the assumptions are, but it's not bad. Having said that, uh, it somehow is, but not really. It's already. Uh, yeah, it's already. Yeah, it's in this folder. Yep. Um, good. Anything else? Good. Um, then the next thing that I want to cover are excursion sets and smoothness. Good. So uh, this we've done. Um, so now I'm talking about excursion sets because um, this is now really where we get started in terms of not studying only the basic properties of random fields, which one could do in any kind of course on in, I don't know, in a master for data science or in, uh, in math or wherever. Um, but now when we look into excursion sets, we actually get um, a lot closer to the uh, fMRI and general neuroimaging applications. Sorry. Um, so with excursion sets, I first um, uh, again provide a definition and then we uh, talk about it. So. Um, this is definition eight. Um, so let xx um, be a random field. Um, S subset RD um, denote A search space, but this is just a name that doesn't mean anything. Um, it's just a name that is given to these subsets of three-dimensional space in um, neural imaging. Um, and more important is uh, the next thing, uh, and let. Oops, let. I was getting ahead of myself. Let. U. That's an U. Or U, sorry, let's say U uh, in R um, denote a level. Call this level for now. You will see that, especially in fMRI, there are like 10 names for this U. Um, then the Excursion set, and this is what we are talking about. Of X, X of the random field inside S, so in the search space, above 
level view um, is defined as EU, so that's what I use to call an excursion set, um, so that it's always clear that it's with respect to this uh, little u. That's the points x in the search search space. So uh, points, because the search space is a subset of, for example, three-dimensional space, and I said the search space that we are dealing with is usually the brain, um, modeled as a subset of three-dimensional space. Um, the excursion set is a set of points in, um, for example, three-dimensional space for which um, x of x is larger or equal to this level. Um, so it's relatively easy to uh, grasp what this means. Um, so if we are in the 1D case and we have um, a realization of a random field that looks maybe like this, then we can, and we define um, a value of u, for example, this value here, then we can uh, use this as um, yeah, the level. And then we see that there are certain parts of the random field um, that are larger, uh, which one do I want, maybe this one, um, that are larger than this. So this is obviously larger than u. And now the excursion set is not what I just here um, colored in red, but the excursion sets are the points in the domain. Um, so essentially these intervals, that's too many colors. Um, the excursion sets are these points um, for which the random field is um, larger than um, the threshold u. Yeah. So that's uh, a u. That's the excursion set. Um, and um, I could draw it here um, quite nicely because I assumed that there is a realization of the random field. So I have this black line, which is the realization of the random field. Um, of course, the excursion set is defined for the random field. So it's uh, um, a thing that becomes real once you obtain a realization. But otherwise, it's kind of um, a quantity that itself is random. Yeah, Because if you fix a specific uh, threshold u, let's say we have fixed uh, this, and we obtain a new realization of the random field, then, for example, uh, we obtain this. And then the excursion set is uh, suddenly empty, or we obtain this. And then the excursion set um, is uh, quite different. Um, so is quite different from the first excursion set. Yeah. So the excursion set uh, is itself a random uh, quantity, and um, the task that Adler and other people set themselves in the uh, yeah, 70s um, and earlier um, is to um, study the probabilistic properties of these excursion sets. So what can one say about the excursion set um, for a given random field? So if you define a random field and you define a threshold, what's going on with the excursion set. So what's the probability um, that, uh, for example, the excursion set uh, has like three peaks, uh, like in the first one, um, or only one peak, uh, like in the second one. Or what's the excursion set uh, probability that there's anything in the excursion set, and so on. And this is not easy. I mean, this is, um, uh, it's interesting, but it's not easy because um, you are, um, um, dealing uh, with two fields of mathematics there, 
um, especially if you go away from the one-dimensional case where Adler thinks, uh, says everything is easy and I think it's also much more analytically known, uh, if you go to higher dimensions, so if you really go to random fields, um, then um, you have um, geometric properties of the excursion sets and there are many uh, that you might want to describe and then you have also um, yeah, the question of how to capture them in terms of the probabilities that govern um, the random field. So it's actually not an easy um, 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 field and there's, it's still ongoing work. So, the, so I think the heir of Adler and uh, Worsley, so the first was Hasshofer and Adler in the 70s and then a little bit 80s, but not much happening. Then Worsley came in and appeared picked that up, especially from the brain imaging context. And then um, Jonathan Taylor um, um, made contributions um, to the mathematics of this in the um, 2000s and, and still is, is working on that. So that's an active math mathematical field and uh, it's um, yeah relatively complex um, to understand uh, what's going on um, with these excursion sets in terms of, so that you can provide closed form analytical expressions for probabilities of these properties of excursion sets. One thing I want to uh, point out right now is that um, the this level U, so this thing here in fMRI, this is called cluster forming threshold. Or cluster defining threshold and it's the thing that you set when you I showed you in the first uh, seminar when you click when you set up these um, when you do your fMRI and in, uh, in results in SPM then you say um, do I want to use a mask no there actually you define the search space and then you click um, something like it doesn't even say a cluster defining threshold. It says something like correct or not correct or whatever. And then you press uh, FWE or uncorrected. And from this, um, from this P value, a, um, um, a T value or whatever your field is, um, usually a T value is created, which then acts as your cluster forming threshold. Um, and it's uh, in uh, FMI, this is always called uh, U. So you can, of course, if you um, have a little bit of experience with fMRI data analysis, now you know that you have a t-value everywhere, and then you can threshold the image, as you have seen many times, and wherever you uh, threshold this, then will, some blobs will survive and other blobs will not survive. And um, this uh, thresholding thing um, f um, forms the excursion set, and then uh, once you have done that, you have also defined your excursion set. We will later of course come to that and um, um, s then investigate what these um, p-values that then get allocated to certain clusters um, mean um, in, in SPM for fMRI. For the moment we are more interested or mainly interested in the probabilistic aspects because um, what uh, SPM then or other softwares then do is to give you the probabilities and um, of uh, clusters having a certain size or being uh, or, or voxels being uh, of a, uh, a certain height. But um, to understand where these values come from, we have to now get into understanding how um, the um, how excursion sets can be uh, described probabilistically. And there are two things um, that um, one can um, say about excursion sets, and this is fairly intuitive, um, but also heavily um, used in um, in random field theory based p-value corrections. At this moment, questions about uh, the excursion set uh, definition. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is uh, one thing that is important in the practical aspect. Um, this is something we will come to, but right now we don't have voxels. 
Um, so right now we have um, just um, the um, real uh, line or uh, 2D real space or um, um, 3 real space. And um, then simply this um, definition of the excursion set um, applies. So um, it's so the cutoff is where um, um, for uh, the x where this is fulfilled uh, versus where this x uh, where this is not fulfilled, um, and that's about it. So the um, the clustering um, that is done when this is um, um, applied in, in discrete um, cases and so on that will come later. Okay, so um, yeah, so I'm talking a little bit of uh, wishy-washy there. So um, I try to um, use the term cluster, although this is... Uh, so I use the term cluster to appeal to intuition and to people familiar with fMRI. Um, the real cluster definition we will do later. For the moment, clusters remain a little bit fuzzy. Yeah? Um, because they have to... Because clusters don't exist in uh, the... Um, in the mathematical um, uh, description of the whole thing. We will see at one point that Friston uses something for clusters that uh, is not really meant for clusters, but for something else. And uh, we will see what that means. Yeah. Anything else? No. Good, so then I would say we um, have a break now and after the break um, discuss more on the intuition of excursion sets.